Hey guys, so today these two videos are going to talk about the colossal influence on media theory of Marshall McLuhan and his concept of the medium is the message. So this is a bit of a diversion from the stuff about earlier in the module, kind of less about political economy, less about ownership, less about mass culture being identical and less about sort of the culture of control which dominates media today. Although that cultural control is important in understanding a little about what McLuhan was talking about, really these lectures, these two videos I'm going to make here are very, very important because McLuhan's thought is something very important for you to understand and to understand precisely. Um, and I emphasize that word, you need to have a very precise understanding of what McLuhan meant by this. The medium is the message itself, is one of the most misunderstood terms in media studies, and um, I'll take great pains to explain it in the next video. But really, our understanding of McLuhan is critical if we want to understand what mediums do and why mediums are so important, not just content. Many, many media courses and media degrees, and indeed, if you've studied GCSE or A-level media, I think, both of those courses are highly specific about content being very, very important. Now, I'm not arguing that media content isn't important, but what McLuhan encourages us to, do, us to do is to look at the influence of the medium itself and how that structures society in particular ways. And so it's a bit of a diversion from a lot of other stuff in media studies, but critically important to consider also. So in terms of what cover in these two videos going to look at technology and causation what McLuhan says are four communication cultures in history and where we are today the concept of the medium and the message and um, the very important concept of technological determinism those last two will be in the second video so let's start with a bit of a thought experiment what are the effects of instant messaging Okay, we do instant messaging all the time. Few of us probably use dedicated um, services like the messaging app on your phone anymore, but we might use Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or Instagram Messenger, or you might be on some, you know, might be on things like Kick, for example, or um, you know, there, there is a myriad of ways of doing it. Snapchat, obviously. So, instant messaging is this thing that comes about. In the early 2000s, in fact, really late 90s, 98, 99, with the um, sort of widespread use of SMS messaging in, 80, in 98, 99. And what is the effect of this? Well, here are some possible effects. Cost to consumer, illiteracy and the impact on the English language, RSI, or what they used to call Blackberry thumb, because you press phone like that and you get RSI injuries in your phone, in your thumbs. New formats and culture, we re-establish speech and we re-establish photography, for example, for the medium of sending messages. Car and pedestrian accents, the number of times I have nearly run some drippy looking kid over because they're texting on their phone, you know, gets to the point with me where I'm not, you know, if I see some kid walk out and their faces in their phone these days, you know, I just hit the accelerator and put the windscreen wipers on, you know, what are we losing? Loss of community. We no longer meet in groups. We now don't have to meet at all. We can just text, 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 text. Boost turnout for elections, maybe, of text campaigns to get people out to vote. Helps group organisation. Do you know how difficult it was to go for a drink when I was a kid? Didn't have, well, yeah, it's kind of sad really, isn't it? But I didn't have a mobile phone until I was like 18, 19. So we didn't have that stuff when we were kids. So we like had to organize stuff when we were in school and college. It's a nightmare. So I'll see you there at seven. Yeah, right. So you know, I'm standing there at seven, there's no one around. I'm just like, well, you know, just wait for people, shall I? So much dead time. Organize on the fly now. Reductions or increases in crime, you know, messaging has been implicated in crimes. It's also been implicated in sort of reduction of crime as well. You know, you message people to say, you know, there's somebody, something weird going on here, avoid this, avoid that. One of my favorites is decline in academic standards. The constant thing, you know, when people switched to instant messaging, it transformed written English in particular ways. And we've seen a decline in the quality of academic English and academic writing over that time because people now use instant messaging all the time so they can't communicate in full sentences anymore. 
Um, I think it's a bit overblown, but I understand the argument. The impacts of instant messaging go far beyond a convenient way just to you know, send messages to people. There are widespread impacts of this. And really, McLuhan's, in, you know, McLuhan's contribution to media studies is to make us think about what new mediums do, what indeed existing mediums do as well, to society as a whole, above and beyond their use case and what content goes on them, what are the wider effects of mediums over time? So it's something as simple as instant messaging has a myriad, you know, and I've missed loads of stuff off here, has a myriad of potential impacts on the whole of society, not just on communication practice. Now, McLuhan's ideas could be construed as being technologically determinist. Technological determinism is the idea that technology is the primary cause of historical change. So we invent a technology, there are effects, and then history changes because of it. That's a very, very difficult position to have because it assumes that the technology itself has some kind of godlike status in our society. It makes us do things. Actually, instant messaging responded to a desire and need in society to communicate faster. If, you know, it didn't just come down and everyone changed their behavior. In fact, what happens is people start using it, they see convenience in it, it starts to spread along those ways and you see effects come from it. But those social, economic and political and cultural effects didn't just come from the technology itself, which is what technological determinism implies. There, there is a far more of a dialectic process here and, you know, a contributory process where we contribute to the very form of messaging. And therefore, this is actually more of a circular thing, whereas, you know, technology allows us to do something. We start doing things and start changing the form. Technology changes to, you know, acknowledge that we use it in certain ways and so on and so forth and we start to see historical change as much more of a process between humans and technology in sort of contribution with one another than just technology was invented and the whole world changed it doesn't quite work that way so what we want to always do when we're arguing this kind of case is to avoid technological determinism because it puts too much importance on technology and too little importance on human beings now the pessimistic view of technological change is <laughs> embodied in this kind of image right you know we invent something and then it's going to rot our brains it's going to change humanity you know it's you know human beings themselves are going to be transformed um no um it, it rarely happens this way you know <laughs> older people even older people than me bemoan smartphones right and say you know well you know, kids just spend all their time on their phones and they don't do this and they don't do that. Basically, they don't do the stuff that they were doing when they were younger. And that's really bad. And what they fail to consider is the stuff they were doing when they were younger sucked, first of all. And secondly, what you're doing on your phones is often very creative, often very social, often extremely valuable stuff. You know, you're learning about stuff, you're communicating about stuff, you're enjoying yourselves, you know, you're having fun. There's nothing wrong with that. So the pessimistic view overblows it. We have optimistic views as well, but there are questions within the pessimistic view that we can consider, you know. For example, when we're looking at mediums themselves, does relying on satellite navigation technology make drivers oblivious to their surroundings? You know, the standard of driving generally in the United Kingdom is so low that I'm under the impression that these days, they must give out driver's licenses with some sort of coupon scheme that you get from cereal packets in the morning. And I see loads of people relying on sat-nav. No, I don't even use sat-nav. Why would I? You just like follow the signs. The signs are there for a reason. The roads are labelled. You know, what are you doing? Like, you know, just go to the place that you're supposed to be going to. Half the fun of driving is getting lost. Interestingly, sat-nav means that most of us now won't have an experience or to have a deep dread of getting lost. There's nothing wrong with getting lost, you know? Just find your way another way, you know? It's not that bad. It's not that scary. We don't live in a scary country. Um, our reliance on sat-nav has not just made drivers oblivious to their surroundings and does cause accidents, does cause bizarre incidents like, you know, van drivers going up paths and things like that because they think it's a road. But also, it means it changes our relationship to the world itself. If we can't sat-nav it, 
and we can't get there in this safe manner through sat nav oh god we're off track we're in scary place <gasps> what are we gonna do i don't know ask someone you know people aren't psycho killers most people aren't anyway you know, at least 70 percent of people aren't psycho killers and you take your chances um yeah you know the effects of sat nav have been to make a generation of drivers that um can't drive anywhere without being told where to go and can't interact with their environment very effectively and it creates a sort of fear of the unknown which is really really frightening because there's really nothing to be afraid of the wider effects of a technology I mean, uh, I'm using some old examples here, and I hate John Humphreys, by the way. I, I think he's a real condescending, and you just put a word in there, right? Um, I hate text messages. How texting is wrecking our language is such an old thing, right? Actually, my opinion is that that kind of communication is very creative, and that kind of abbreviation and changing of language for a different medium shows high degrees of creativity but there is this pessimistic view that things like sending messages and so on is ruining people's ability to pay attention and to write in long forms whereas there is complementary evidence or you know oppositional evidence i really should say children who uh, regularly text message are better english than those that don't even if they use text speak so the effects are never as clear-cut as people think the optimistic view of technology is that technology is a great enhancement to social process and that it does bring us together, like in this flash mob here that we've shown from this uh, mall picture. And I think the reality of these things sits somewhere in the middle and the reality sits away from there being a pessimistic or optimistic view. It is all about what human beings do with technology that is important, not the technology itself. It's how we use it. And while we're oriented towards the world through our technology, by our usage, that's the important view that we have to take on board. And we can use McLuhan's work within that mindset as well. We don't have to be technologically determinist, which is largely what, certainly what the pessimistic view is. And to a certain extent, the very optimistic view is technologically determinist too. We must take into account use and how we adopt our practices with technology. So McLuhan, where does he start to be important? Okay, McLuhan's four years of communication is something very important that we have to understand because this helps us chart out how McLuhan saw different technologies shaping society in general. McLuhan identified four years of communication, the oral era, the written era, the print era, and the electronic era. And I think now we can add the digital era as a separate era from the electronic. And each communication technology had an effect on the society in which it existed. So look at these in turn in the oral culture poets and bards are socially socially influential those who can tell stories those who can relay a story of what the world is like became important people there were no facts because facts are recorded facts have to be written on something the oral culture you know going back thousands of years ago but this is pre-writing and therefore facts are meaningless because they're just spoken so he says it's a fact, I say it's a fact, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe the guy who tells the story better. Myth, history and social reality are all one thing and this is what an oral culture was. And for McLuhan, speaking is a medium, right? So the dominant medium was speech and in a society dominated by speech, the features of the society are radically different to ours. Okay, no facts. Myths are as important as written history is to us today. It's an extremely different culture. You know, the people who are seen as influential in that society are those who can speak well. Well, <laughs> maybe that's not that different to today, but um, it's, a, it's a radically different social system to the one we have today. As written culture emerges for the first time, information can be stored outside the human memory. Therefore, you start to have the recording of fact and factual information. You have a basis for knowledge above and beyond what somebody tells you. Extremely important development. Communication becomes uh, possible over time and space. You can write things down and they can go to other places. You know, well, you know at the first, it's quite difficult to do that if you're chiseling things in stone with the invention of paper and so on you start to be able to send messages. This means communication can happen between different groups. 
over space and time. So it's much easier to send something or to transport one thing than to transport a whole group of people. The sender and receiver of a message can be detached from one another. You can record something by writing it down and somebody else can see it afterwards. In an oral culture, you have to be speaking to somebody. You have to be in proximity to them. Now communication could be detached from people. These have profound effects on human society. Tribes can become dispersed over large spaces, but still communicate with one another because they can write things. They can leave inscription. And you get the development, therefore, of common languages for communication. Wow. You know, you all of a sudden have the ability to have an economy because you can write down what somebody owes you and how much they should pay you. You have the fundamental basis of a market economy emerge with written culture. Just some of the effects of the invention of writing. This idea that you can externalise human memory to make something objective rather than subjective becomes the critical basis of Western society, effectively. We have objective facts all of a sudden. We have a history of knowledge now going backwards. We can record events. We can learn history. History as a discipline doesn't exist without written culture. See how the invention of something leads to so much more in terms of culture? Then for a whole bunch of time, nothing happened, according to McLuhan. But print culture comes around in the 15th century. It magnifies the effects of writing. Okay, so we're still talking about, you know, it's related very closely to writing. But you have books, which become mass availability. So I'll talk more about this in media history in the second semester, but what does the print revolution do? Well, it means that you can mass produce books. Previously, books were written by scribes and therefore you had a whole power system involved with, it, with people deciding what books should be written and who they should be written for, in what languages should they be written. The, inventing, the invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in 1450 meant that those social controls on knowledge got lifted you can print anything now in any language as many times as you like and give it out to as many people as you want because you've lifted the controls on how much could be produced by how many people. This standardised languages. It meant that the language as it was in print became the standard version of it. Spelling was standardised, pronunciation was standardised. You increased literacy, which means you increased more people who were involved in politics and culture and society, etc., etc., and started the content station of knowledge. Dominant knowledge up to the print, at the beginning of print, was largely Christianity in Europe, you know, and, and Catholicism, really, prior to that. It's no surprise that uh, the Reformation begins post. The print revolution, you know, Martin Luther nailing his 96 theses to the to the door of the cathedral. That's after print, not before. Okay, so you can contest dominant knowledge. So really, the foundation of democratic society is in print culture, the ability to produce information, to freely have information, and to assess that information in a free manner comes with the invention of print. So this thing was there to improve the process of producing books had wide reaching consequences. An electronic culture, we're really talking from the mid 19th century onwards with the invention of the telegraph and things that came after it like telephone, television, radio, etc. Instantaneous communication. So even in print culture, you, you still had a lot of barriers to communication. You know, you have to print something, you have to move it along, etc. Electronic culture, starting with the telegraph, where you tap some messages uh, into um, a telegraph system, which then transmit them and get decoded on the other side, but it can travel vast distances very quickly. Instantaneous communication means that the world itself becomes much smaller. If you've got instantaneous communication, it makes no difference whether you're in talking to the person next to you or you're talking to the person in Madrid when you're in Swansea. You're communicating with them instantly, opening up information to more users, but obviously you need special tools to participate. And what I, why I say that we should perhaps think of the digital era as being further than that is, although McLuhan identifies the key aspects of the digital era in this description of the electronic culture, we are now, it's not almost instantaneous, it is instantaneous global trans, um, 
communication. All information in theory could be opened up to all users, but we still need the special tools to participate. Okay, that's all I want to say about McLuhan for now, but I will be back with video two where we'll get really into the medium is the message.